Welcome to the King County Library System Foundation's 20th Annual Literary Lions Gala. And it promises to be one of our best ever, so I'm very happy you're all here. I'm Nancy Pearl, and tonight I'm with you to celebrate readers, writers, and libraries for a great cause, raising funds to enhance libraries and reading activities in our community. I can't think of anything better to raise money for. <laughs> Last year was the first year that we brought all of our wonderful authors up on stage, and we're gonna do that again this year. So let me introduce you to our honored guests. Tony Angel, Erica Bauermeister, Bonnie Becker, Mackenzie Bezos, Jesse Bloom, Deb Coletti, Megan Chance, Tara Conklin, Amanda Copeland, William Dietrich, Tom Douglas, Robert Dugoni, Johnny Evison, Kathleen Flanagan, Lori Frankel, Kristen Hanna, Amy Hutveni, Josh Henderson, Patrick Jennings, Mike Lawson, Rochelle Mead, Julia Quinn, Sarah Reichard, Carol Lexa Schaefer, Paul Schmid, Maria Semple, George Shannon, Jenny Shortridge, Samantha Vamos, Lance Weller, and last but not least, G. Willow Wilson. Come on up. Come on up, get just a little closer. Okay. R right foot's ready. Start your dance. Okay. Here they are, the people who make our reading life so wonderful. Please give them a warm round of applause. Please check out their biographies in your program, and the books they've written make, I can testify to this, make an incredible reading list. I hope you had a chance to meet many of our authors before dinner. After dinner, you'll, after dinner, you'll have another opportunity um, to talk to them, um, something that I really personally very much enjoy doing. And mostly, most sincerely, thank you our very favorite readers for joining us this evening. Now, in an homage to Live By Night, Dennis Lehane's latest best-selling novel, our menu has a distinctive theme the flavors of lime, mango, plantains, and rum will transport transport you to his main character, Joe Coughlin's world in Cuba. So enjoy your meal, and the program will resume shortly. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted, to, um, I wanted to share with you an experience that I had recently because I think it speaks so eloquently to, um, to the power of books and reading and libraries to make the world a better place. In December, I got an email from a young woman named Sunshine Eisen, who is the cultural affairs officer at uh, the US Embassy in Sarajevo, Bosnia. And she wanted me to come to Bosnia to, um, she wanted to, in Bosnia, she wanted to do a program like the one that we started in Seattle called, in Seattle we called it originally If All Seattle Read the Same Book. She wanted to call it One Bosnia Herzegovina, One Book. And she wanted to aim it at teenagers 
in the country of Bosnia. And I won't go into um, the, the history of Bosnia, the tragic history of um, the former Yugoslavia. Uh, but I will say, if you're interested in the Balkans at all, there are two books that you really ought to read. One is Robert Kaplan's Balkan Ghosts, and the other is a book by Peter Moss called Love Thy Neighbor, A Story of War. Um, he was in Bosnia during the Bosnian War in, uh, in the early first half of the 1990s. But Sunshine had this idea that she wanted all the teens in this country, which is really fractured, um, really, really not even a country at this point at all, but rather a group of people who identify with their ethnicity, which, which has now become combined with their religion. So it's really a country of Muslims, of Serbs, and of Croats, and the children are educated in, in different schools, um, Ser Serbs and Croats can go to the same physical school, but they're not taught by the same teachers. They don't ride on the same school bus. The country is run by um, the Dayton Peace Accords, which ended the Bosnian War, uh, set up a system of three presidents, one Croat, one Muslim, and one Serb, who rotate leading the General Assembly. There is no sense of one country. Kids are growing up knowing only others of their religion or their ethnicity. And Sunshine's idea was to get them all reading the same book and meeting together at libraries and in schools and in community, just br bringing people together, teens, to talk about the book. And the book she chose was Sherman Alexie's The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. Um, if, you're, if you're familiar with that book, it's about, if you're not familiar with that book, it's about um, a young 15-year-old uh, teen growing up on the Spokane Indian Reservation and his attempts to figure out who he is and what he wants to do with his life. There's a, when I, she told me that was the book that she had chosen, and she told me this before she got in touch with me, she, I, I really, I thought, how, how would that book cross the Atlantic and the Adriatic Sea? I mean, how, how could those kids in Bosnia have any sense of that book? And, you know, but of course I didn't say anything to her, but boy was I wrong. That book connected not only to teens there, but to adults there. And she wanted me to come there to train people in leading book discussions that might touch on very difficult issues, issues of ethnicity, issues of religion, issues of looking at the past of one of of um, of one group of people being mistreated by badly mistreated by another group of people and so I went there in January for a week of intensive work meeting with librarians meeting with university um, uh, university students university professors meeting with students meeting with teens talking about Sherman's book, but more importantly, teaching them about how to talk about these issues that touch so deeply on their lives because of the way that this, the country, the state the country is now in. And one of the, one of the most, it was a life-changing experience, and I know that sounds so weird at my age to say that your life has been changed, by this experience, but it reaffirmed everything that I have always believed about books and libraries and the coming together to develop a vocabulary, to develop community. And in one of the first programs that I did, it was in, Bosnia is divided into two parts. There's the Bosnia and Herzegovina, the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and then on the other side, and it's almost like there's a wall there, it's like apartheid, as, as one, of the, um, one of the men told me. On the other side is the Republic of Serbia. And we were in Banja Luka, which is the biggest city in the Republic of Serbia. And I was speaking to, it was a mixed group of, of teachers, university professors, librarians, and university students. And 
in Sherman's book, at the end of the book, his main character, Junior, makes a list of all the tribes that he belongs to. So on that list is things like he's a member of the Spokane Indian tribe. He's a member of the tribe of 15-year-olds. He's a member of the tribe of cartoonists. He's a member of the tribe of chronic masturbators. You know, he's a member of the people who love salsa, um, you, you know, and uh, tortillas. And, and I finished every one of these discussions, every one of these teaching sessions with these people by having us go around the room and everybody talking about a tribe that they belong to. And at that first time that I was there, this woman said, she was sitting in the front row, and she said, I belong to the tribe of mothers. And from the back of the room, another woman said, oh, I belong to that tribe too. And they turned and looked at each other. And these were people who might not have had anything else to say to one another, but made a connection. And I think that that's what books and reading and libraries do. They make connections between us. And I like to think that in this Venn diagram, that our, lives are, 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 that our lives are made up of, that where we all converge, where we come together, is the center of that diagram where we share a common humanity. And I'm not naive enough to believe that, that Sunshine's program, One Bosnia-Herzegovina, One Book, is going, to, is going to undo the damage that the Dayton Peace Accords have done there and that years of war have done there. But I do believe that it's a first step, and I do believe that those students who are going to take part in those discussions are going to learn that they are not so different from somebody who might have a different religion or be of a different ethnicity. It was a very powerful experience, and, and it just, it, it, as I said, it just reaffirmed all my belief in, in books, in reading, in libraries to really make the world a much better place than it is now. So I wanted to share that with you because it was so meaningful to me. And um, I hope you weren't bored by that. Um, that was an indulgence. Oh, thank you. Now I'm very pleased to introduce Bill Potasek, the director of the King County Library System. Bill? Thank you, Nancy, and uh, thank you all for being here, and especially I want to thank the authors. Years ago, when we began this event, there really wasn't any single event that really brought together the public and authors to really recognize and to thank them for all that they do to bring stories and information to the people in this area. So let's give another round of applause to all of our great authors. You know, any great organization, and I want to say that KCLS, by everyone's accord, is a great library, uh, gets there and stays there because it has a great team. And we're so indebted to our board of trustees who are a critical part of that team. These community volunteers spend their own time to oversee this library, and in the course of that, learn more about libraries and hear more from every community in King County than they ever imagined. I'd like to now ask Lucy Krakowiak, our president, Jessica Bonebright, Robin McClellan, Rob Spitzer, and Jim Wigfall to stand. If you'd all stand, please. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Well, 2012 was another great year for, for the King County Library System. We opened a new library in Duval, we gave Newcastle its first ever library and provided Auburn with a beautiful renovation and expansion. And by the way, in almost all of the grand openings at the ribbon cuttings, we had on average 1,000 people or more at those events. People really love their libraries here in King County. We also renovated the library connection at South Center, and that comes 10 years after the KCLS Foundation raised the funds to build this innovative and popular library outlet in one of the country's busiest shopping malls, also modeled on what we did at Crossroads, as a matter of fact. 
We also made substantial improvements to the library in Enumclaw, the most recent community to join the KCLS family. In 2012, we added the Kenmore and Woodmont libraries to the long list of awards from the American Institute of Architects. Now in 2013, we'll complete three projects, the long-awaited garage in Bellevue. will finally be done, folks. <laughs> Thinking about Bosnia, getting those Ukrainian contractors to work with the city of Bellevue has been a really interesting experience for us, but that's another story too. The Federal Way 320th Library will be finished this year, and the Vashon Library will be, the expansion will be done too, so we're going to help to keep Vashon weird. So as you can see from the slides, we have seven other projects in the works as we wind down our commitments from the 2004 capital bond measure and the annexation of Renton into the system. Thank you, King County voters. <clears throat> so how about a few numbers really quickly. In 2012, the King County Library System was the busiest virtual library in the entire United States. We downloaded over one million ebooks. <laughs> Many on Kindles, too. That was for our table. <clears throat> Last year, we circulated more than 22 million items, keeping the King County Library System as one of the busiest libraries overall in the United States. There were 10 million visits to the 48 physical library buildings of KCLS and 39.8 million visits to the KCLS website. Now, the King County Library System, with the help of the Library Foundation, has taken on the bold and audacious goal to increase the amount of reading and, indeed, the level of literacy of all King County residents through the, the award-winning Take Time to Read project. We hope you've seen the banner across the driveway at SeaTac Airport, and stay tuned for the Redometer app that's going to be due out later this year. Finally, in 2012, KCLS partnered with seven school districts, several city governments, and numerous community partners on the collective impact project called CCER, which wants to improve the success in school and ending in meaningful careers for students in South King County. KCLS led the Let's Read effort to keep those students engaged in reading over the summer with librarians actually getting out of the library and going to parks, nutrition sites, summer school sites, all to encourage and assist students with their reading efforts over the summer. They touched a whole population of kids who would otherwise never get to the library. And we have even bigger plans for this summer. So let me wrap up my update by acknowledging the work of the King County Library System Foundation, another critical part of our team. Let's have all the foundation board members stand and rec let's recognize them for their dedication to providing support for innovative library programs. Please stand. <laughs> Give them an applause. <clears throat> you guys are terrific. So now it's my pleasure to introduce the president of the King County Library System Foundation. I was told to keep this really brief and not give her undue titles that I did last year or something. So I'm going to just say that Carrie Glover was a two-term member of the King County Library System Board of Trustees. She has been a board member and a leader in almost everything she comes into contact with, including Whitman College, United Way, and the Urban Libraries Council, as well as her recent past life as a lawyer and a great lawyer at K&L Gates. Please join me in welcoming Carrie Glover. Carrie? So good evening. And hello. On behalf of the Board of Directors of the KCLS Foundation, thank you for joining us for this 20th annual Literary Lions Gala. First, I want to recognize the staff of the foundation for their hard work on this remarkable event. Executive Director Jeannie Thorson, Cindy Sherrick, Claire Wilkinson, and Cheryl Smith, would you stand up and let us recognize your work tonight? <laughs> Special thanks also go to board members Kim Moen, chair of this gala, and Karen True and Dean Smith, the fundraising co-chairs for the Community Mosaic Project that is our focus tonight. Please give them a round of applause. And could you stand? So 
So now comes the most exciting part of the evening for me, just rich with potential. I'm up here for a few minutes to ask for your support for an exceptional project. I am a Western American, born and raised. During my childhood and adolescence, virtually all of the travel I experienced was through library books in my imagination. By the time I boarded an airplane for my first transcontinental flight, I sported a college degree and was headed back to the East Coast for more education. I think about my ancestors sometimes, both the immigrants and the migrants who made my life possible. Over several generations, they undertook almost unimaginable hardship so that I could be born in this region, one of the lucky ones in a land of opportunity. And I wonder, would I have been so brave? My ancestors, brave as they were, are not unusual. Chances are, they are like yours. We are overwhelmingly a nation grown on immigration. Immigration is America's great pride in the world. It's deeply intense source of creative energy and it's daunting challenge. This is especially true in Washington state. We are 10th among the 50 states for the proportion of our population that is foreign born. Seventh for immigrant founded engineering and technology companies. And we have our own Ellis Island in Tukwila, just north of SeaTac Airport, the largest US citizenship and immigration services facility in the Northwest. Over 17,000 new arrivals pass through its doors each year. Many of them settle initially in the Tukwila area making the Tukwila School District, as reported by the New York Times, the most diverse school district in the nation. Let me repeat that. Tukwila School District is the most diverse school district in the nation. Its students speak 75 different native languages. The King County Library System, in the tradition of library systems throughout our national history, plays a central role in orienting and integrating the newly arrived. For many immigrants, our KCLS libraries are the first experience of free access to information, the first time to rub shoulders in a trusted American institution, and the first exposure to wonderful public librarians, professionals, and as I've said before, virtually all librarians are wonderful, and that's worth celebrating. <laughs> Our KCLS libraries help these newly arrived to advance and succeed here, thereby serving us all in Puget Sound as these residents successfully transition and disperse into our many neighborhoods and communities. To do its job better, KCLS needs our help. Let's take a look. I didn't realize how rich Tukwila was. It was always just a little spot on the map on the way to the airport or on the way to the mall. But when we talk about the crossroads of Tukwila, it's not just a metaphor, it really is. There's five freeways running through here, but when you get off those freeways and find these little neighborhoods and the different ethnic communities that live within them, you really get a feel for the real flavor of Tukwila. Well, the Tukwila community has changed a lot, probably over the last 10 to 15 years. I come from a family here in Tukwila that has been here almost 100 years. My grandparents were immigrants from Sweden. 
If you're driving around the South Center area, you may see the Strander Boulevard sign, and that's my family. Tukwila has been referred to as the Ellis Island of the Northwest, and I think that's a, a pretty good analogy. The city is the most diverse place in the nation, and then along with my school, we have 75 different cultures and languages, and there's Somalians, Indians, Russians, Turkish people, and then my Jewish friends sitting right next to me, my Indians friends sitting on my other side. People of the world are in Tukwila. They've heard about it. America is the dreamland, and they get here and they will do just about anything that they need to to take care of their families. So they've brought them here to be safe, they've brought them here so their children can be educated, and they brought them here for the American dream. They come here with very, very little. They've just fought so hard. So our current library is on the small side, and it's just busy from the moment we open until we close. And there's really not any space for someone to come and just learn what a library is. Oh my god, it is a madhouse. Because I mean, it's just been so crowded. People are just like on top of each other. There's not like enough desks for everybody and enough computers. We're at the site of the new Tukwila Library, and my staff and I get really excited about the possibilities here. The Library Foundation is raising $1 million create what we call a community mosaic. This 2,000 square foot addition to the new library will be a great place to mingle. At times it will be a civic gathering place, at other times a performance space. We'll host cultural events, festivals, citizenship classes, and naturalization ceremonies. Mosaic will even have this glass wall that opens out onto the Taquilla Village Plaza. That's something we've never done before. We have an extraordinary opportunity to create a space that says you are welcome here. We're just a few blocks from the high school. A few blocks away is the Homeland Security Building, where many people get their start in America. The new library and the extra space is, is extremely vital to this community. The new library with the additional 2,000 square feet, to me, means a place to be educated, to have supports for our kids to have a place to go and do homework. The KCLS Foundation is working hard to raise extra money so that we can have this extra space. The community mosaic is beneficial and it's a great place to invest resources for the future. I'm a firm believer that if you give kids something to do, you know, something that's interesting to them, then they'll probably choose that path. And there's a lot of good kids out here. And this is about more than just Tuck Willow. And so we've got people that will be in our library today who next month they'll be your barista in Bellevue, they'll be your doctor, they'll be your teacher, your college professor, somebody who makes an app for your phone that you can't live without. Chances are they started here in Tuck Willow. In order to progress a community, you know, in order to make an actual change, you've got to give people some motivation and give people some hope. And that's something that the library could definitely stand for. I see children from all over the globe with varying levels of issues, of problems, but you see the hope in every child's face and you see the future. It's my hope that this new library and the plaza is going to create a real sense of community for everybody. I think it's a place that's full of hope. It's always nice to have a story of hope. That love is what our community needs. So now you have the story. Tuck Willow will have a new library by 2015 as part of the KCLS capital plan. And the project for which we're asking your support tonight is a discrete 2,000 square feet of additional space in the new Tuck Willow library, expanding it from an 8,000 square foot to a 10,000 square foot library. The place we imagine and plan for is a flexible space to accommodate civic and community gatherings, including events attractive to seniors in the adjacent senior housing plan, lectures and classes, technology training, orientation activities, student mentoring, and even a festival or two. We will create opportunities for an unusually diverse community, 
part traditional and part transitional, to come together in optimistic and helpful ways. This inspiring space, which you now know we're calling the Community Mosaic, will change lives, and we want you to be a part of it. The KCLS Foundation has committed to raise the $1 million cost. We are nearly halfway there. Our board of directors of the foundation is 100% participating. The Paul G. Allen Family Foundation has approved the project and awarded early support. Other generous donors have come forward as well, and we're sincerely grateful for their participation, but we need you. Please join us in supporting this smart and much needed project. Do what Thad and I, my husband, do. Think about how much you want to and can reasonably give. And then, in a flash of foolish and impetuous generosity, give more. <laughs> we can even put your name on a donor wall if you want to get really generous. So the table hosts have envelopes. And I, if they haven't already done so, I would ask them now to pass around the contents of those envelopes. Well, I'm still trying to remember when I first met Dennis Lehane, our speaker for tonight. And I think that it was um, in the 1990s, early in the 1990s, at a dinner at an American Library Association meeting that Dennis's publisher, Harper Collins, sponsored. And um, Virginia Stanley, um, <laughs> who, who uh, is a good friend of mine, always tends to put me next to um, the authors at those dinners because she knows that I talk. <laughs> and, um, and I remember talking to Dennis about his books. And at that time, Dennis's books um, were all featuring um, a pair of private investigators, Patrick Kinsey and Angela Gennaro, all set in Boston. You might have seen <clears throat> the movie made from one of his books, Gone Baby Gone. If I were going to, yeah, it was a great movie, I thought. It was a great book, too. If I were going to um, start, if I had never read a Dennis Lehane and I, and I liked um, P.I. novels, I would definitely read those books in order. Start with the first one, which has a terrific title, A Drink Before the War. But Dennis is one of those writers who, um, who, who, isn't, who isn't content to stay in a box um, to write uh, private investigator novels. He, he's interested in stretching the boundaries of his, of his writing, of his craft. And his two newest books, um, the Given Day and Live by Night are, are, are also set in Boston, but they are an entirely different breed. And I so admire writers who can do that, who can, who can make a success of writing a certain kind of book and then challenge themselves and succeed in writing something almost entirely other. So um, I was thrilled to, uh, to learn that Dennis was gonna be our guest tonight. Um, I urge you to go out and, uh, and get those books because they make great reading. And um, now please join me in welcoming Dennis Lehane. Hi. Thanks. All right. Um, Nice room. This is all right. This looks a lot like my house. Um, I, I, uh, I'm going to talk because it seems to be, it was funny because people kept asking me this question tonight too, and I, I didn't want to answer it. I was like, you know, it's the friggin' speech, so you know. Uh, you know, the question people seem fascinated by is, is how um, how I'm standing before you today. How do you become a writer? What happens? What's the process? Um, because it's such an odd profession. Most people don't do it. I mean, I think it's kind of like everybody has one in the family, kind of like an actor. But it's really a question of which restaurant do you work at. I mean, it's not. <laughs> There's a big difference between the people who say they're doing something and people who actually you know, do it. Like, the, believe me, the, the people you saw up on the stage today, that's a, it's a, those 30 writers, that's a very rare thing. It's a lot to say you're going to do something. It's a very different thing to actually do it. So, <laughs> so 
So there, I, I, I kind of narrowed it down to a loose 20 reasons that I'm, I'm standing up before you today. But there's 10 that are really easy. And, and th I'm going to start with the, with the warm and fuzzy moment, because I'm not very good at it. So I'm just going to get it out of the way. Um, the, the, the one through 10 reasons that I'm a writer is, is basically libraries. It's as simple as that. That's why I'm here. That's why I, um, I, I have a reputation for being harder to get a hold of than Jimmy Hoffa. And I don't like to do a lot of um, things. I won't wear ties. I, I, I just, you know, I'd rather not um, do anything that requires that I shave. So, but libraries can get me like that. And, and that's because when I was a kid, I grew up in a working class immigrant family. Um, and uh, when I was a kid, the nuns, and I think the only kind or benevolent thing I can ever remember nuns doing for me, um, <laughs> told my mom that I liked to read, that I seemed to really, really like to read. So my mother, you know, as a working class family, we couldn't afford you know, books as a luxury. We couldn't just, just have them around. I mean, we had a Bible and we had like a set of encyclopedias because my dad clearly didn't see the salesman come in. But, <laughs> but that was it, you know. And, um, and my mom took me to a library. And, and then I went to that little library. It was, it was in a really kind of rough part of town. And it was a really rough library. It was still kind of, it was kind of crumbling in on it itself. But, um, but I was like, oh my God, you can, you mean I just, I hand you this card. You give me a book, you trust me to take that book home, and then, and then bring it back in two weeks? Um, so it, it, that was the beginning. And then my mother also took me to the main branch of the Boston Public Library, I think when I was about eight, as a surprise. And I don't know if any of you have ever been to that building, um, which I am now proudly a trustee of, but it's like, it's like going to Versailles if you're a kid from the wrong side of the tracks. Um, so my mother takes me to this, th that building, and, and I look around, and there's, you know, there's, there's statues, and there's beautiful paintings hanging on the wall, and there's m marble everywhere. And what that, what that building says to me is what libraries say to any kid from the wrong side of the tracks, any kid who doesn't know that world exists unless somebody takes them by the hand and shows them. What it says is, is you matter, okay? You, you have worth. Um, it says, um, that society, the society you live in, be that represented by your town, its city, its state, the country, cares about you. Um, and they, they care about you for no other reason than it is right to do so. Um, this, in my opinion, makes libraries an unequivocal good, or as the Tea Party might call it, socialism. Uh, <laughs> When you hand a kid the keys to all the knowledge in the world, the knowledge of the ages, you show him that anything is possible, anything. Um, the other 10 reasons I'm about to cite do matter, um, but the simple fact is that without a library, I unequivocally would not be standing before you today. So thank you, thank you libraries, thank you librarians, thank you all you wonderful donors who support libraries. Um, Please give yourselves all a round of applause. All right, now I'll get to the other reasons I'm here. One is what I call a storytelling gene. It's where I'm going to begin and I'm going to end. Um, the storytelling gene. I, I've said that I'm from an immigrant working class family. I am not from a literary background. But I am from a storytelling background a very storytelling background. My father had 17 brothers and sisters. Seriously. The, the, <laughs> the oldest brother never met the youngest brother, and they lived full lives. Um, the oldest brother emigrated to America, the youngest, they didn't just pop back and forth over the pond back then. The youngest brother grew up, and then he became a bar, he started to own some bars. And, and then the oldest brother heard that he would actually charge family members for a drink. So he was like, screw him. I don't want to meet the bastard. And he never met. <laughs> so um, 
my family would do this thing. They, they, they all came over, and my mother was the same. She came from a smaller family, a family of 15. And, <laughs> and half of them came to Boston, and they created this, this village, basically, in Dorchester, Massachusetts. And, and so it was, um, people say, you know, you grew up in 1970s, 1980s Boston. And I said, no, no, no. I grew up in 1930s Ireland. Um, <laughs> I didn't even know people who spoke without a brogue until I was like six and went to school. Um, so they would get together every day with this clannish group of people. They had no friends. They were all friends with brothers and brothers-in-laws and sisters and sisters-in-laws. And they would all gather every weekend at one of the other's houses and it would rotate. And then they would get together and they would tell stories and they would um, drink highballs and schlitz and smoke cigarettes. And, and you knew they were drunk when my dad and my Uncle Tommy started singing Danny Boy. That was always the cue. <laughs> and um, so they would get together and they would tell stories. And my brother and I began to notice something strange would happen. About every six weeks, the, um, the same story would come back into rotation. But they'd tweak it. <laughs> Usually the ending. They lied, essentially. And, <laughs> Not only was this not frowned upon, you realized this was the point. Everybody would hear the same story again, and they would be looking and waiting on bated breath to see the part where you lied. <laughs> and this was encouraged. So right then became something that I didn't recognize in the moment, but would become instrumental in everything that I became as, a, as really as a human being, but certainly in my career. I, can look back and say that my family and everybody in it, and most people in my culture, they didn't much like facts. They, <laughs> facts are very relative, um, particularly to an often conquered culture. Uh, <laughs> truth is something else again. Truth is a very different thing. And it would be many years later when I was in graduate school that my professor would, um, would, would say that he would describe writing as, writing, is, writing great fiction is the lie that tells the truth. And I thought, oh my God, that's my family. Um, <laughs> the, the next thing that really contributed was that my father every Saturday as part of this you know, loose appreciation for the truth and for, well, I'm sorry, for facts, my dad would take me to the farmer's market in Fields Corner in Dorchester and, and, and he, my mother could never understand, or maybe she did and she just put up with it, that um, why a man who had spent the first 27 years of his life on a farm could take so long at a farmer's market. And the because my father could spot a bad tomato from 100 yards out, but the truth was is because we hit this thing in about four seconds flat. I mean, he'd like throw me a bag and then like he'd toss tomatoes, I'll oh, catch the potatoes, catch it, and then boom, we'd throw it in the trunk and we'd drive back up Dot Ave, which is the main drag, and we'd go to a bar. And, <laughs> and I would sit in that bar, I was like 10, 11 years old, and I'd sit in that bar on Saturday afternoons and I would get a, a ginger ale because no ice, because it looked like a real man's drink and, and a red straw. And, uh, and I would sit there and I would listen to guys tell stories. That's what they did. And this was, this was now Irish culture fused with Boston culture fused with working class culture. And there was um, no um, sort of uh, uh, exemptions made for how flowery your speech was. There were no exemptions made for um, setup. I learned very quickly what the rules of good storytelling were, at least in a bar. And the first one was get to the point, fast. Um, second thing was be compelling. Third thing was try and be funny because the point of most working class stories is ultimately pretty tragic. It's we got screwed. It is. I mean, the point of most working class stories, if you really listen to them, is, is yes, I once again got screwed by either God, my boss, or my wife, or whatever it was. But, and then the punchline will always be something like, but I slashed his tires. Um, <laughs> you know? It's the small victory. <laughs> I keyed his car. Um, so, um, so I would listen to these guys talk, and if, they, and, if, and if you weren't telling the story well, they would shout you down. There was nothing polite. There was no, there was no music like on the Oscars. 
you know, they would just shout you down, sit down. Or they'd say, you know, Sully, turn the Sox game back on, or whatever it was, and they would shout you down. So I saw sort of storytelling as blood sport at a very early age. Um, the next reason I'm a writer was because from that, probably, I, I became interested in story. So I, I love to read. Now, loving to read in Dorchester, Massachusetts, is, is a, um, well, it can put your life in danger. Uh, so you, you have to commit. You really have to commit to reading. If you're, so I, you know, because otherwise they'll just beat your ass into the ground. They catch you sitting there reading Dickens on your free time. That's just not going to go over well. Um, so I, I became very, very determined to be a reader. And uh, I was also reading way past my level, which created a second front in this warfare, which is the librarians would rat me out. Yes, they would rat me out. So much for my civil liberties. They would rat me out to my mother. And they would tell my mother what books I was bringing home. And then my mother would go grab them and scream at me. You know, you're reading the choir boys at, at nine. And um, so then that made me good at, 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 at hiding books, uh, really good at hiding books. And also, again, I was compelled. I was, I was, I was, I was passionate. Um, so uh, that was the next thing. Then that led to, I think, a very na natural thing, which is I began to fall in love with narrative of all forms. Narrative is by itself. We call it art. Art comes from the word artificial. Um, so narrative is fake. Narrative is fake. I mean, you can always tell a fake story by the fact that it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, life doesn't work that way. Life's random. Life's arbitrary. Things happen for no reason. Characters drop in and out of your life who you never see again. None of that works in story. Um, so. I began to fall in love with narrative as a way to sort of make sense of the universe for me. Um, and narrative could take any shape or form. I loved books. I loved movies. I loved songs. I loved concept albums. I loved anything that had narrative at its core. Um, another great reason I became a writer, I frankly suck at everything else. I have, <laughs> I have no demonstrable talent outside of shooting pool. And it, it just wasn't quite enough to go on the road with that. Um, so I don't, there's nothing else I'm good at. And which is a wonderful moment, truly. I look back with great happiness in that moment. There was no other way I was pulled in other directions, like my friends who became, you know, stockbrokers or lawyers or, or just professions that they sort of rationally thought was a good idea, but they didn't really feel in their soul. I wasn't good at anything. I could try something else, and I'd just fail. Simply fail, flat on my face, fail. I went to my parents at 20, I said, I wanna become a writer. And they said, well, you do suck at everything else. So <laughs> what would that process look like, you know? Um, around this time, I was 20, I'd realized something else, which is another reason I became a writer is a little more embarrassing to admit, but I might as well be honest. I became a writer for chicks. You know, writers, artists in general, get women that they could never ever get if they were in any other profession. My friends would be like, you're a drunk just like us. And I'd be like, but I'm a sensitive drunk. I've got angst. And they feel that. Um, and it worked. I could realize that. They'd be like, you're a poor, slovenly bum, just like us. And I'd be like, yes, but I write. And that's why I date her. And she <laughs> picks up the check a lot. Um, <laughs> another reason is we're back to this concept of truth. Um, uh, Bostonians have a very interesting relationship with facts. Um, Bostonians, let me just say this, as any of you who are from here, I don't know, you can back me up on this. Bostonians, there's no, there's no place like Boston on the planet. I've been everywhere. I truly have. And part of it's just because it's old. It's the most European of all our, uh, all our cities. Um, but also it's just because Bostonians are a little like, like cracked in the head. They're just, they're a little off. And I say that as, as one, I'm a little 